This video is sponsored by myself. Learn CSS with my full CSS course, which is now available on my website, slingthedragon.io. My course aims to respect your time, be quick and concise, and above all else, it aims to take you from an absolute beginner in CSS to an absolute wizard. At the time of recording this video, the course is currently on sale, and you can find the link in the description of this video. On the web, everything is a box, literally everything. All the elements, the images, the videos, the paragraphs, the headings, entire sections, everything. And with everything being a box, everything has this box model applied to it. We see the box model consists of the content, the padding, the border, and the margin. The margin creates extra space around an element which is used to push other elements away. So for example, in this layout, we have an image, a title, two paragraphs, and a button. Without any margins, there's no space separating the elements, and so they're essentially all touching each other. To fix this, what I can do is give each individual element a margin bottom to push other elements away, creating the space needed for them to all be separated. Next is the border. The border is pretty straightforward. It's literally a border we can add around our elements for design purposes. So for example, this button has a transparent background, and when I give it a border, we see it looks a lot better. Next up is the padding. The padding adds space inside of an element. This is not to be confused with margins because margins add space outside of an element. However, the space created by a padding is added inside of an element. This distinction is very important because margins and paddings have different use cases. For example, in this pricing section, the content inside each box is touching the edges. To fix this, what I can do is give my boxes a padding. And when I do, we see space is added inside of the boxes. And now the content inside each box is no longer touching the edges. Finally, we have the content. The content is just the width and height of an element. So for example, this GIF is too big. I give it a width and a height, and now the GIF is smaller. The name box model makes it sound more complicated than what it actually is. But the reality is that the box model is just a name that encapsulates the content, the padding, the border, and the margin, and that's it. Now that you know what each one does, we need to put it to practice with actual code. In my index.html, inside my empty body element, I'll add a div with the class of box, and that displays hello world. Then in my CSS, I'll select our div by its class name of box, and I'll give it a font size of 2 rem, and a background color of pink. Under my background color property, I'll add a comment that displays box model. And under this comment is where we're going to be practicing the properties of the box model. On my live server, I'll right click and select inspect to open the developer tools. With the dev tools open, I'll click on the select button and select my div element. Now that my div element is selected, on my dev tools, I'll open the computed tab where we see we have a visual representation of the box model. When I hover over the content area, we see this highlights our div element. Currently, the width of our div covers the entire width of the viewport. This is because div elements are block level elements. So for example, I'll give my box a display property of block, and when I save, we see nothing happens. Nothing happens because block is the default display of div elements. And block level elements cover the entire width of the viewport. However, we can still change the size of our div with the width and height properties. I'll remove the display of block since it's set to block by default anyways. And then under our box model comment, I'll give our box a width of 300 pixels and a height of 100 pixels. When I save, we see our box now has a width of 300 pixels and a height of 100 pixels. And this is also represented in the content area of our box model. Next is the padding. Looking at the padding area in our box model, we see there's no value. To add a padding, we can use the padding top, padding right, padding bottom, and padding left properties. I'll set all four to 32 pixels. And when I save, we see this added space inside of the box. And looking at the padding area in our box model, we see we have 32 pixels of padding in all directions. Using these four individual properties is fine. However, there's a faster way to do it using the padding shorthand property. 
I'll comment out all four padding properties and I'll add the padding shorthand property. When I give it one value of 32 pixels, we see this assigns a padding of 32 pixels in all directions. When I give it two values, the first of 32 pixels and the second of 64 pixels, we see the first value represents the top and bottom paddings and the second value represents the left and right paddings. When I give it three values, the first of 32 pixels, the second of 64 pixels and the third of 100 pixels, we see the first value represents the top padding, the second value represents the left and right paddings and the third value represents the bottom padding. And finally, when I give it four values, the first of 32 pixels, the second of 64 pixels, the third of 100 pixels, and the fourth of 10 pixels, we see the first value is the top padding, the second value is the right padding, the third value is the bottom padding, and the fourth value is the left padding. An easy way to remember which value is what is to think of it like a clock. These values are represented clockwise with the first value being top, second value being right, third value being bottom, and fourth value being left. Next is the border. I want to add a border to my div element. To do so, all I have to do is give my div element the border property. The border property takes in three values. The first value is the size of the border. I'll set it to five pixels. The second value is the style of the border. I'll set it to solid. And the third value is the color of the border. I'll set it to black. When I save, we see our div has our five pixel solid black border. And looking at our box model, we see that the border gets added in between the margin and the padding. The second value is for defining the line style of our border. Solid is the most common one. However, there's actually seven others. Here's an image with all of the different line styles. In most cases, you're going to be using the solid option, while the others you will use in niche exceptions. Finally, we have the margin. Looking at the margin area in our box model, we see there's no value. To add a margin, we can use the margin top, margin right, margin bottom, and margin left properties. When I set all four to 20 pixels, we see this added 20 pixels of space outside of our element, essentially pushing it away by 20 pixels in all directions. And looking at the margin area in our box model, we see we have 20 pixels of margins in all directions. Now, just like we have a shorthand property for the padding, we also have a shorthand property for these four individual margin properties. I'll comment them out and I'll add the margin shorthand property. The margin shorthand property functions exactly the same as the padding shorthand property. When we give it one value of, for example, 20 pixels and save, we see this added 20 pixels of margin in all directions. When I give it a second value of 40 pixels, we see the first value is for the top and bottom margins and the second value is for the left and right margins. When I give it a third value of 100 pixels, we see the first value is for the top margin, the second value is for the left and right margins, and the third value is for the bottom margin. And when I give it a fourth value of 500 pixels, we see this added 500 pixels of margin on the left side because when we use four values in our shorthand property, the values are represented clockwise, where the first value is the top, second value is the right, third value is the bottom, and fourth value is the left. I want to clean things up, so I'll remove all the properties I commented out. And then on my margin shorthand property, I'll set it to zero. We see, despite our box having a margin of zero, there still seems to be some space between the viewport and our element. The reason this is happening is because if we look in our developer tools on my elements panel, I'll select the body element, and then in my styles panel, I'll find the default styles that the browser automatically assigns to the body element. We see on the right side of this rule set, it says user agent style sheet. User agent style sheet means the default styles that the browser automatically assigns to HTML elements. We see on Chrome, which is the browser I'm currently using, it assigns a display of block and a margin of eight pixels in all directions to the body element. This is the reason we currently have a gap between the viewport and our element. To fix this, what I can do is select the universal star selector and give it a margin of zero. This is a reset that I always add before building a website.
And all it does is it removes all of the margins on all of the elements that automatically ships with a margin. And we see with our margin of zero on the everything selector, the gap between the viewport and our element is removed. As a side note, you should make sure that you create this rule set at the top of your CSS file for specificity reasons, so that you don't overwrite the margin you purposely add on elements like the margin we're adding on our box, for example. Furthermore, while we're at it, we can also add the padding of zero on our universal star selector to reset the padding on all elements that automatically ship with some padding. This is also a common reset I add before building a website. By now, you probably understand that the box model is just a name that is used to refer to the content, the padding, the border, and the margin. Content, padding, border, and margin together is the box model. However, there is something quite annoying about the box model. If I were to ask you definitely, what is the size of our div? You would probably say that our div has a width of 300 pixels and a height of 100 pixels, like we defined in our CSS. However, this is wrong. When we give a value to the width and height properties, this defines the size of the content area in our box model. We gave our width a value of 300 pixels and our height a value of 100 pixels. And looking at our box model, we see the content area has a width of 200 pixels and a height of 100 pixels. However, the content area isn't the entire div. Both the padding and the border are inside the div. Only the margin is outside. And because both the padding and the border are inside our div, we need to add them up to figure out what's the actual size of our div. To demonstrate, I'll set my padding to 16 pixels. And now our content area has a width of 300 pixels. Our padding has 16 pixels on both the left and right sides. And the border has 16 pixels on both the left and right sides. To figure out the actual width of our div, we need to do some math and do 300 plus 16 plus 16 plus 5 plus 5, which equals 342. Our content area has a height of 100 pixels, our padding has 16 pixels on both the top and bottom, and our border has 5 pixels on both the top and bottom. The math for this is 100 plus 16 plus 16 plus 5 plus 5. This equals 142. So the real size of our div is 342 pixels by 142 pixels. This is super unintuitive, but fortunately, there is a solution to this problem. There's a property called box sizing, which I'll add under our margin property. This property only has two possible values, content box or border box. When I set it to content box and save, we see nothing happens. This is because content box is the default box sizing of the div element. However, if I set it to border box and save, we see something happened. First of all, our div shrunk. And secondly, looking at the content area in our box model, we see the width and height is no longer 200 pixels by 100 pixels. It's now 258 pixels by 58 pixels. What happened? Before, when we had the box sizing on its default value of content box, the width and height properties were only defining the size of our content box. However, now, with the box sizing set to border box, the width and height properties are no longer only defining the size of the content area. Instead, they're defining the size of the entire div, including everything inside it, such as the padding and the border, because both the padding and the border are inside the element. Essentially, what border box is doing is expanding the size of the content area to include the padding and the border. And the reason this is desirable is because, again, both the padding and the border are inside the element. And now, we don't need to do mathematics to know what the size of our div is. We know that what we set in the width and height properties will be the actual size of our element. So for example, we set the width to be 300 pixels and the height to be 100 pixels. I don't need to calculate anything because I'm using a box sizing of border box on my div and I know that border box expanded the content area to include the padding and the border. Therefore, the width and height of my div is 300 pixels by 100 pixels. We can confirm this by calculating 258 plus 16 plus 16 plus 5 plus 5. This equals 200. Border box is what you always want to use. You pretty much never want your elements to have a box sizing of content box. 
Instead, what you want is for all your elements to have a box sizing of border box. And here's two important reasons why. First of all, by using border box on all your elements, you'll always know the actual size of your elements without needing to do mathematics to figure it out. Whatever you set on the width and height properties will properly represent the actual size of your element. And secondly, some elements like the button element, for example, has a box sizing of border box by default. There's also other elements like the table element, the select element, the input element, and a few others that by default are border box elements. If you don't set everything to border box, you'll have an inconsistent mixture of elements that either use content box or border box by default. By setting everything to border box, you'll have a predictable way of knowing the size of all your elements. And even more importantly, you'll have consistency in the behavior of all your elements. Now the question is, how do we tell all our elements to have a box sizing of border box? Well, instead of defining the box sizing property on individual elements like what we're currently doing with our div element, what we can do is remove the box sizing property from our div element and in our universal star selector, give it a box sizing of border box. When I save, we see it worked. Our div has the box sizing of border box and if we had other elements, they would also have a box sizing of border box. Now, although defining the box sizing of border box to everything using the universal star selector like this is fine, there's a more popular way of doing it that ultimately makes sure that 100% everything gets the box sizing of border box. I'll remove the box sizing of border box from our universal star selector and above it, I'll reselect the universal star selector. However, this time I'll add a comma star selector with the before pseudo element appended to it, comma and star selector with the after pseudo element appended to it. Inside the curly braces, I'll give it a box sizing of border box. This is the proper way of giving all the elements the box sizing of border box. This will make sure all our elements, including pseudo elements, get the box sizing of border box. This is a reset I always add before building a website. I would never build a website without this reset. This is probably the most important reset you can have on a website. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and hitting that subscribe button. I know pretty much every YouTuber says this, but liking the video and subscribing really does help out the channel a lot. And it shows me that I'm doing something right with these videos. Also, if my way of teaching resonates with you, do check out my full CSS course. The link to it is in the description of this video. Thanks for watching.